Okay, so our uh, last speaker of the morning session is Anwar Ray at the University of British Columbia, and he will be speaking on Euler characteristics in Iwasawa theory and their congruences. Thank you so much, Brian, for uh, the opportunity to speak here, and I would like to thank all the organizers for this conference. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a first-year postdoc at UBC, and I'm working with uh, Sujata on some projects. And uh, for instance, this project is um, some joint work with, uh, with Sujata, which I want to talk about. Okay, so I want to start by, you know, just having like a brief conversation about Iwasawa theory. For those of you who are not initiated with Iwasawa theory. So throughout, P is going to be a fixed prime number. And so Iwasawa theory is really concerned with the structure of certain Galois modules arising from arithmetic. And so these Galois modules typically, you know, classically they were class groups. And then uh, eventually we start talking about, we start thinking about elliptic curves and there are Galois representations and like more general Galois representations. Um, and these are actually gonna be defined over certain very specific infinite Galois extensions of Q. And I do want to talk about the prototypical example considered by Yusawa. And so Q mu, so Q mu P to the n plus one is the uh, cyclotomic extension generated by P to the n plus first units. And QN is a sub extension uh, with Galois groups that mod P to the n. So Q, QN is basically called the nth layer. And then we take a tower of these number fields, which are contained in each other. So Q1 is contained in Q2, et cetera. And this tower is called the cyclotomic tower. And of course, like the prime P is fixed throughout. And now we take the union of all of these number fields and the union is called the cyclotomic extension. And it's an exercise in Galois theory that the Galois group of the cyclotomic extension is isomorphic to ZP, the p-adic integer. So this is why it's called a ZP extension. So Iwasawa's early investigations led him to study the variation of variation of class groups, or rather P class groups of QN. So um, the P power, so, so the class group of QN is a finite abelian group. And we just look at the P primary part of this class group. And that's what I'm going to denote by AN. And it turns out that there's a very explicit formula for AN. So Iwasawa showed that there are certain very well-defined invariants, uh, called new lambda and new, such that the order of an has a very specific formula. It's p to the power of mu p to the n plus lambda n plus mu. And this form, this this is actually going to be true for large enough values of n. So I want to say a few words about his approach, and the approach is kind of like a purely Galois theoretic approach, and it is as follows. So there's always a natural map from an plus one to an induced by norms. And we take the inverse limit of these modules an. Uh, and then this inverse limit is actually a module over, we think of this as some kind of a module over the cyclotomic extension. So it acquires the action of the Galois group of the cyclotomic extension over Q, which we denote by gamma. So this is, the, this is the module with an action by gamma. And remember that gamma is just C. So Iwasawa introduced a certain very important algebra. And this is basically called the Iwasawa algebra. And so this is an inverse limit of group algebras over ZP. And it so happens that the reason that we consider, the reason why we really consider these ZP extensions is that this algebra 
turns out to be a formal power series ring in a single variable x over z. So this is kind of like an amazing fact that, you know, like the fact that this formal power series ring actually shows up is really what helps us a lot in uh, setting the Galois theory of these modules. And this is because the structure theory of these ZPX modules is very well understood. And we'll touch upon this fact later. So these invariants that you uh, studied basically came about via the analysis of the structure theory of these modules over ZPX. I mean, as we should obviously note that the isomorphism with ZP of X is non-canonical. However, there is an isomorphism and the invariants will actually be well-defined uh, and not depend on the isomorphism. So I just wanna jump ahead a little bit and just introduce the Iwasawa theory of elliptic curves. And this is this theory is really anal anal analogous to the uh, the period class groups in pop towers. So Greenberg and Mazur initiated the theory of elliptic curves and their Yusawa theory. And throughout, we're going to fix an elliptic curve over Q, and we're going to assume that it has good odd reduction at the prime p. So first of all, this just means that it has good reduction. And uh, and the coefficient at at p is 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 a unit. So this is uh, this, this is a very explicit criterion. And they study the variation of these Selma groups as one goes up the subatomic tower. So a little bit of notation before we talk about these Selma groups. So if I take any abelian group M, I'm going to denote its p to the n torsion by m p to the n. And the p to, p to the infinity torsion is just the union of all p to the n torsion. And if I look at elliptic curve, and I look at its p infinity torsion, then this is actually isomorphic to two copies of qp mod z. And that's simply because the elliptic curve is a torus. But it's not just an abstract group. It also comes with an action of the absolute Galois group, which is the Galois group of q bar over q. All right, so the Selma group is basically defined by certain Galois cohomology classes. So these are basically uh, classes, uh, first cohomology classes for the action of the absolute Galois group on EP infinity. And so we can define these for any number field extension of Q. So the Selma group of E over F consists of uh, one cohomology classes for the action of the absolute Galois group on, e, of, on EP infinity, satisfying some local constraints, which I'm not gonna specify. But the key point here is that the Selma group is just a group which sits in a short exact sequence. And on one side of the short exact sequence on the right, we have the P, the P primary part of the TH chapter which group. Now this group on the right is supposed to be finite, conjecturally. On the other hand, on the other side, we have the points coming from the elliptic curve over the number field F. So the Selma group really is an object that like really describes the points on the elliptic curve. And this is why these Selma groups are really interesting. So now what we do is we think of the Selma group as some kind of like an analog of the class group. And we take the direct limit of the Selma groups as we pass up the cyclotomic CP extension. So this direct limit is taken respect to certain natural restriction maps in Galois cohomology. And n, n varies up to tower here. So this is this is the object that we really want to consider. And it it acquires the action of lambda, which is ZP of X. And what we really want is, is a finitely generated lambda module. So in order to get one, we, we need to basically take the Pontryagin dual. And when we do that, we actually get a finitely generated torsion lambda module. And this is what we are denoting by M infinity. So now it turns out that such finitely generated torsion lambda modules uh, 
their structure is kind of simple to describe. So up to a certain pseudo isomorphism, M infinity dec decomposes in two cyclic modules. And so each cyclic module is basically described by ZP of X modulo a certain polynomial or a power of P. So we have a number of terms which are basically of the form ZP of X modulo power of P. And we have a number of terms which are of the form ZP of X modulo a monic polynomial. Uh, so, so, so this is kind of like a decomposition. And now we can define these Iwasawa invariants as follows. So the mu invariant is just the sum of these exponents of P that arise in this decomposition. And the lambda invariant is basically just the sum of degrees of these uh, distinguished polynomials. And now we introduce the main object of study, which is the generalized Euler characteristic. Now, first, when the, um, when the group E of Q is finite, so in other words, when E has rank zero, it turns out that the cohomology groups of gamma acting on these Selma groups are all finite. And in this case, the Euler characteristic is just the alternating product of their orders. So the order of each one of these groups is a power of P and we're just taking this alternating product. Now it turns out that when E has positive rank over Q, then these, uh, these cohomology groups are no longer finite. So this formula does not make sense. And so we have to, uh, we have to take a derived version. And I'm not going to write down exactly what the definition of this derived Euler characteristic is, but this is what's called the generalized Euler characteristic. And this is the Euler characteristic what that one considers when the elliptic curve has positive rank. All right, so I want to uh, I want to talk about an explicit formula for the Euler characteristic, which is really a piadic version of the Bertzman and Dyer formula. So first of all, a little bit of notation. So I have two non-zero uh, piadic numbers, A and B, and I say that they are equivalent if, um, if A equals UB for a certain piadic unit U. So if they differ by a piadic unit, then they are equivalent. So in other words, if the power of P dividing them is the same, then they're equivalent. And so this formula is some kind of like an analog of the usual BSD formula. Recall that the BSD formula tells you what um, the leading non-zero term of the Hasse VL function of an elliptic curve should be in terms of certain invariants. And this Euler characteristic or rather generalized Euler characteristic really is related to the leading term of a certain piadic L function. So there's a piadic analog of the Hasse VL function, and the or the characteristic is the is related to the leading coefficient. And there is an explicit formula for the Euler characteristic defined in terms of certain invariants, which I'm going to define. So here are basically RP is what's called the piadic regulator. It's like a piadic analog of the usual regulator. So there's I mean, so you might be familiar with the height pairing of elliptic curve. So there's the piadic analog of the height pairing and the piadic regulator is just the determinant of the height pair. And it's conjectured to be non-zero. And then of course, Sha is the K-trap which group and tau is the Tamagawa product, just the product of all the Tamagawa numbers. Um, right, so so this is, this is an explicit formula for this Euler characteristic. And another thing that I should mention is that this Euler characteristic is not only just um, a piadic number, but it's also a piadic integer. So now I wanna talk about uh, the notion of congruence of two elliptic curves. And now I'm gonna start talking about some of the results here. So, to any elliptic curves give any elliptic curve gives rise to a piadic Galois representation, and that's the representation on the state module. 
And we see that the two elliptic curves evenly to are P congruent if these chaotic Galbraith conditions are congruent mod P. So this can be stated a little bit uh, more concretely. So one way of saying this is that when I look at E1 of P, this is just, you know, two copies of Z mod PZ. So it's, you know, it's, it's a two dimensional FP vector space. And the same goes with E2 of P. And if these two vector spaces are isomorphic as Galba modules, then we see that they are P congruent. So they're sort of like close to each other chaotically in this Galba theoretic sense. So now the idea here is that if we have two elliptic curves which are P congruent, then we expect the Iwasawa invariance of E1 to be related to the Iwasawa invariance of E2. And these types of investigations were first carried out by uh, Greenberg and Watzel. So Greenberg and Watzel showed that uh, two P congruent elliptic curves with some additional properties. Then the Iwasawa invariance mu and lambda for E1 are related to the Iwasawa invariance mu and lambda for E2. So you might want to uh, you might ask what does this relation entail? So it means that if mu is zero for E1, then mu is zero for E2, and there's some uh, and there are some results for lambda as well. So I just want to talk about uh, so now we want to uh, investigate if the same sort of results are true for the the, the order characteristic. So suppose we have two elliptic curves which are p congruent and p ordinary, then we want to ask if these are the characteristics are congruent mod p. And the simple answer to this question is no. So we have two elliptic curves which are uh, both of rank one and they're congruent mod five. This is something that one can check by just comparing the Fourier coefficients of the associated modular form. And um, it turns out that by just using the VSD formula that we wrote down, we can just actually compute these values and see that they're not five congruent. Okay, so there's just a caveat that we have to be careful about. And the answer the two, I mean, so the solution is to account for certain local L factors at the bad price. So there's a very optimal set of bad primes that one has to consider. And one has to like account for the local L factors at these primes. So at each prime in sigma naught, we uh, basically account for the local L factor at one. And uh, I'm just gonna denote by phi sigma naught of EI to be the product of the local factors at the primes ranging through sigma naught. So sigma naught will consist of a very small set of bad primes uh, for the elliptic curves, E1 and E2. I'm not gonna specify exactly what sigma naught is. Now, so now we can write down the result. And the, the answer to the question here is like, we do need the ranks of the elliptic curves to be the same in order for this result to apply. And once we, once we assert that the, uh, the ranks of the elliptic curves are the same, then we do get the congruence that we are looking for. And if the ranks of elliptic curves are not the same, then irrespective of what the other characteristic of E2 will be, it turns out that this, this quantity for E1 is always going to be this by P. All right, so, um, so can someone remind me how much time I have left? Uh, about two minutes. Okay, awesome. So I just want to say a few words about the proof. And the proof is like entirely Galba theoretic. And it goes as follows. So when we're looking at, at the Euler characteristic modulo P, it's actually detected by the P torsion subgroup of the Selmer group. So this is some kind of Galba theoretic fact. And what one wants to show here is that when I look at this P torsion subgroup of the Selmer group, it's actually completely detected by the P torsion of the elliptic curve itself. So the idea here is one defines a sort of Selmer, one defines a Selmer group for this residual representation, EI of P, such that this, such that these two modules are isomorphic as, uh, as Galba modules. And then when one does this, it turns out that since E1 and E2 are isomorphic, it turns out that the P torsion of the Selmer group for E1 will be isomorphic to the P torsion of the Selmer group for E2. 
And therefore it will turn out that the other characteristics will be the same modulo. So this is kind of like the main idea uh, behind this sort of proof. However, the only problem here is that this isomorphism is not, uh, does not hold. And so one has to account for these extra factors at the back frame. So this isomorphism here is not true on the nose. And it so happens that we have to um, we have to remove the constraints at these auxiliary primes. There's, certain, there's this very optimal set of bad primes that we could consider and just remove those constraints. And uh, these are the constraints that actually contribute to these uh, local auxiliary, these auxiliary factors. All right, so that, that is all I have to say, thank you. All right, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, questions for the speaker? Can you continue this congruence uh, mod p squared mod p cubed so on? I guess natural question if you if you kept track, uh, if you knew the elliptical effect congruent mod higher power of p. Yeah, so so I have a long answer to that question, and uh, so so first of all, like initially when we wrote the paper, we wrote it for high, like arbitrary powers of uh, arbitrary congruences. But then we realized that there aren't many arbitrary, like there are not, not many high p square congruences between the curves. So uh, it's very, I mean, those congruences are kind of like very uh, far and few in between. And you can find some order like nine congruences, but then finding order 25 congruences, I, I mean, I asked some experts on the subject, including Davina, and like they don't think they're like possible to find like um so yeah so congruences between elliptic curves defined over q are sort of um you know are sort of far between they're not they're not so easy to find for uh for large primes or like you know powers of primes and so on however like a lot of these results should generalize to modular forms and we also generalize these results to elliptic curves over arbitrary number of fields and in, the, in those contexts, it actually really makes sense to have these higher higher power congruences and so on. Um, so, it, I mean, it's an interesting fact that, you know, like for mod, like if you look at Galbraith representations coming from modular forms, you have a lot more Galbraith representations, a lot more congruences. And, um, there's a lot of deformation theory of Galbraith representations, which, which helps you find a lot of families of Galbraith representations. Um, thanks. Other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, uh, so this 